Hey guys, Henry here with you today in another episode of Archaeology Unveiled. And today we'll explore some of the secrets of the mysterious Ethiopian Bible. So stay tuned. Because many people believe that Ethiopian Christianity began with the account of the servant of the Ethiopian queen being baptized in Acts 8, 26, 39. Another church history, however, claims that an apostle who lived in antiquity is responsible for the evangelizing of Ethiopia. Two youthful preachers by the names of Frumentius and Adesius are recorded in the ecclesiastical history of Rufinus, as having done so in the Ethiopian city of Axum during the reign of Constantine the Great. Frumenius met Bishop Athanasius after the royal family had embraced the faith, and he provided him the support he needed as well as the title of Bishop of the Ethiopian Church. The history of the Ethiopic Bible is lengthy and intricate, going all the way back to antiquity. When Christianity was first introduced to the area in the 4th century ad, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and its scriptures were born. The old Jez language, which was spoken by Ethiopians at the time, was used to write the Bible that these early Christians in Ethiopia used. Christianity spread quickly throughout the nation. The Egyptian traveler, monk, and historian Cosmas Indicopoulos reported that Ethiopia was a Christian nation during his visit there in the middle of the 6th century. This was brought on by the monarch's propensity for Christianity and the large number of Christian immigrants who fled to Ethiopia. These were primarily monophysites who were expelled from Byzantium as a result of their condemnation at the Chalcedon Council in 451 AD. Nine of these pioneers erected churches, established monasteries, and laid the groundwork for the Ethiopian church. They also translated liturgical literature. According to monastic tradition, Saint Abagarama, one of the nine migrants, is the author of the Ethiopian church's gospels. Incorporating aspects of regional culture and traditions, the Church of Ethiopia has created a distinctive brand of Christianity over the years. Additionally, it includes texts that are not included in other Christian traditions' canons, like the pseudo-epigraphs and other texts. The Old Bible continues to be utilized extensively by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church today, and is regarded as a significant component of the nation's cultural and religious legacy. How is the Ethiopian Bible different from others? The Ethiopian Bible has a number of additional books that are not regarded as canonical in most Christian nations, which is one of the primary differences between it and other Christian Bibles. The first book of Enoch, Jubilees, The Wisdom of Sirach, and other works are classified as pseudo-epigraphs or apocrypha. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church regarded them as important and thought they provided vital knowledge, thus they were incorporated in the old scriptures. The Ethiopian Bible is written in Jazz, an ancient Ethiopian language that is not used anywhere else in the world, which is another notable distinction. This limits its accessibility and makes it challenging for those who do not know the language to obtain the information it contains. This is one of the elements that has contributed to its continued preservation and its original form. In comparison to other Bible translations, the Ethiopic Bible offers some variations in how some events are understood. It's interesting to note that the canon itself differs from other canons as well as the additional writings they contain. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church's canon differs slightly from other Christian traditions in some ways. For instance, a narrow version has 81 books total, including 27 from the New Testament, all of the Septuagint's Old Testament books, the Apocryphal Enoch, Jubilees, the books of Ezra, and three from the Maccabees. The expanded Ethiopic canon contains the listed books together with four books of the Synod of Church Practices, two books of the Testament, and the Ethiopic versions of the Epistle of Clement and the Didascalia. The primary narrative, which is found in other Christian Bibles, is presented with regard to Jesus Christ. As we've already mentioned, the main distinction is how some events are seen. The tales of Jesus' birth, life, teaching, miracles, death, and resurrection follow the prophecy about his birth at the beginning of the Ethiopic scriptures. The Ethiopian church holds that Jesus is the second person of the Holy Trinity, the incarnate Word of God, and the Savior of humanity. Jesus is entirely God and fully human, according to the Ethiopian church, which emphasizes his divinity more so than his humanity. 
It also emphasizes the role of the Virgin Mary in the life of Christ, as well as the importance of prayer and fasting and following Jesus. How come no one is talking about the ancient Ethiopian Bible that has all the original scrolls? The Ethiopian church does not have the original Bible scrolls, which are thought to have been written on parchment or papyrus and have not survived to the present day. But it is true that only recently has this early Bible become more extensively acknowledged. It keeps the ancient texts, which are still revered and regarded as authoritative today, in copies and translations. The absence of translations into other languages and the fact that the Ethiopian church is a very small, Isolated society in comparison to other Christian faiths are thought to be the reasons why the Ethiopian Bible is not as well recognized in the West and among non-Ethiopian populations. In addition, it has its own unique liturgical and spiritual practices that are almost unknown to foreigners. The inclusion of other texts, known as pseudo-epigraphs, that are not generally accepted by other Christian traditions as canonical is another factor contributing to the scripture's obscurity. However, there has been an increase in interest in the Ethiopic Bible and its distinctive qualities in recent years, and there have also been initiatives to increase its accessibility to a larger audience through translation and academic study. It is more than 800 years older than the King James Version and was written in the ancient dead language of Ethiopia called Jazz. It was found in a secluded Ethiopian monastery and is the first Christian Bible to be illustrated. The extraordinary Gospels are known as Garima, after a monk who traveled to Africa in the 5th century. According to an old myth, Abba Garima traveled from Constantinople in 494 and, with the aid of God, was able to duplicate the Gospels in a single day by delaying the sun's setting. First Untouchable Bible The Pentateuch, which provides information about the history of the Israelites and the creation of the universe, as well as the laws that God gave them, is part of the Old Testament of the Ethiopian Bible. Additionally, it consists of works on history, wisdom, and prophecy that impart lessons on how to live effectively in accordance with the prophet's recorded words as well as poetry, wise prose, and teachings on these subjects. The New Testament of the Ethiopian Bible consists of the Gospels, which describe the life, teachings, miracles, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Acts of the Apostles, which describe the early Christian church, the Epistles, which provide teachings and direction for the early Christian communities, and the Revelation of John, which contains a prophecy of the end times and God's ultimate victory. There are two manuscripts, Garama I and Garama II, with Garama II likely being the earliest. They were given this name in memory of Saint Abba Garima, who is recognized as the author of the Gospel. The Gospel texts in Gs, the Ethiopian language of the Kingdom of Aksum from the 4th to the 7th century, which became and is now the religious language of the Ethiopian Church, are found on the first 348 pages of the 348 pages that have survived from Garima I. They start with 11 illustrated canonical tables in arcades. A 322-page book titled Garama II is also written in jazz. It features 17 pages that are illustrated, featuring four lovely images of evangelists who are placed in front of their respective gospels and a different portrait of Eusebius of Caesarea who is placed in front of his canonical tables. The images of Matthew, Luke, and John are frontal and barely distinguishable from one another, but Marx shows him in profile seated on the Alexandrian bishop chair. A second illustration shows Solomon's temple or perhaps the fountain of life, with a staircase that is peculiarly shaped and only found in Christian iconography. The miniature's prevalent Byzantine aesthetic and dating to the 6th century agree stylistically. While Jack Mercier contends that the text and drawings were unquestionably created in Ethiopia, Marilyn Heldman questions whether the illustrated pages were actually produced in Ethiopia, or whether they were imported in final form from antiquity Syria or Egypt. The two manuscripts' texts diverge, and Garama I doesn't seem to have been directly derived from Garama II, indicating that the common translation from which they were derived was probably made much earlier. As a result, the gospel translation in Ethiopic may be older than previously believed. The original cover of Garama I is the oldest cover in existence that is still affixed to a book. The Gospel of Saint Cuthbert from the 7th century comes next. The cover is decorated with a huge cross in the center and is made of copper with gilding and a hardwood backing. 
There are no longer any jewel containing holes. The amazing artifact is maintained in the north of the nation's Garuma Monastery, which is situated in the Tigray region at a height of 7,000 meters, close to Adwa. Given that the nation experienced Muslim conquest, Italian invasion, and a fire in the 1930s that destroyed the monastery's church, the gospel's survival is astounding. It's unclear exactly how the Ethiopian gospel came to be discovered. However, it is known that it was found by unintentional tourists in the 1950s who photographed it. Later, these were used to thoroughly examine and study the book in order to determine its high worth. Carbon dating yields dates ranging from 330 to 650, which enticingly matches Abagarama's entry into the country. The evidence implies that it is entirely plausible that he held the first volume of the ancient Bible in his hands, even if he did not finish the task in one day as tradition claims. In a recent interview, Blair Prede of the Ethiopian Heritage Fund said, Ethiopia has been forgotten as a supplier of these wonderful items. Since there are few highways in these hilly regions, many of these ancient Christian relics can only be reached by hiking and climbing to far-off monasteries. The Garama Gospels have been preserved over the years in part due to their high, dry location. They have also been kept in the dark so that the colors appear vibrant. Some of the pages in the restoration from the 1960s wouldn't even turn, and they were falling apart. The pages were hastily sewn. For us, this was the most amazing of all our projects, and the patriarch, the head of the Ethiopian church, had to give his permission. We are currently undertaking other programs for the restoration of wall paintings and religious texts. What more of our history is hidden in the hard-to-reach corners of Ethiopia? We can only guess. One thing is for sure, follow the channel of consciousness because in it you will find more such little known but very important knowledge. Support us by subscribing to the channel and sharing this video.